Hello everyone and welcome to my Dragon Knight guide for warriors, for beginners, for advanced players, for endgame players. I will cover everything in this guide you need to know for PvE. So stay tuned and let's start right away. First of all, I want to cover some basics so you understand why some item builds are built that way and you will understand why things are done the way they are done. So. How much crit do I need as a Dragon Knight? You will need around 380,000 crit with Jewel of Rage. If you don't have Jewel of Rage, you will have to play with much more critical value than if you don't have Jewel of Rage. This Jewel in general is like the most important Jewel for farming in my opinion, because it gives you attack speed and a lot of critical value. That's why if you don't have Jewel of Rage, you will have to build more crit. In general, you will have to focus on crit in the beginning. If you don't have 500% critical value with Jewel of Rage, you should increase your critical value gems till you reach that point. That's the first thing you're going to do because as even as Dragon Knight, but all the other classes have to do this as well, you will do a lot more damage if you focus on crit first before damage, before life, before anything else. Critical value is the most important stat in my opinion. Onto that SDK, you have in your skill tree a skill that allows you to reduce cooldowns if you hit a critical hit. So in case you hit a mob with a crit, your cooldown will be reduced by one second for each critical hit you have. That's why crit is even more important for Dragon Knights. The next thing we need to cover up as basic is how much attacks do I need as a Dragon Knight. And there, that is where the breakpoints come into play. The la last breakpoint is at 3.636 for the smash skill. So you will have the highest breakpoint with the smash skill at 3.636. Why do skills have breakpoints? That's because of the frame rate they have. You always go for this highest breakpoint as a DK because your main attack, which will be which will be covered later on, is your smash. On top of that, if you reach an attack speed from over 4.0, you will get a buff or like stacks, which are called battle anger. At 4.0, you will stack one battle anger stack for each attack you do. So let's say you, you smash an enemy 10 times, you will have 10 stacks of the battle anger. If you reach 100 stacks, you will get a rage buff for 30 seconds. That will give you 100% more damage. That's the reason why you want to have over 4.0 attack speed in the end game. A lot of the case like to play with even higher attack speed because from the quick striker skill again, you will get a lot of attack speed increasement. It's 30% with level 1 and 5% with every other level, so you will get 50% more attack speed as DK. That's why it's so easy to reach high attack speed values and to be able to stack this buff faster. At 4.5 you will get one stack more. At 5.0 we will get more and stack more of battle anger for each attack. So if you, if you have 5.0 attack speed in the fight, you get three stacks of battle anger per smash or per attack. But if you reach, for example, a 6.0, you will get even more stacks, which is five in this case. So you can stack this buff even faster. The next question is how much death do I need as a Dragon Knight, as a warrior? In the, in the current meta, you will there's no need for tanks. But if you want a tank build anyways, let me know in the comments. And also feel free to leave a like and a subscribe if you want to see more content like this, more tutorials, or just write me in the comments what you want to see next. Why is there no death build needed in the current meta? That's because from the wisdom tree you get all the death you need for casual farming. In case you want to tank a boss like Mortis, you can play with two health point buffs, which give you additional health points so you are able to tank him even with lower HP. Or you could also play an additional health point item and you are still able to tank Mortis with that. If there would come higher modes, if like they would 
put like a mode that's more difficult than bloodshed, then more death would be needed. But on, in, as I said, in current meter, it's not necessary. The next basic we want to cover up is runes for Dragon Knights. Which runes to upgrade first? And in my opinion, you should upgrade your Wisdom rune first. And after that, your Matari runes. Why is that? Because those two rune types are the cheapest runes in the game. You only pay a, a, like a small part of the rune dust in comparison to the other runes. And on top of that, with that, you can unlock the achievement for runes so you can push your runes to higher rarities. That's why I would recommend starting out with these two. On top of that, in the beginning, you will play a lot with groups because it's really hard to farm alone in, in the beginning. And that's why you should upgrade your group runes. Especially the realm rune is really important. So you can do teleport runs, which is good for wisdom farming or also for fast farming later on. And for many events, you will need realms. That's why you should upgrade the realm rune next. On top of that, the, the Andermant rune, which is really important for blood chest farming. People are always happy about if you already have this one to legendary, if you're farming blood chest with them. After that, you can also push up your wisdom room so you even get more wisdom in group. Then for stats, I would start with the crit runes because as I said, crit is the most important stat in the game because if you have a lot of crit, you will do way more damage. After that, I would push up the attack speed movement speed and damage runes all at one time so you do more attacks which also means more damage on top of that damage runes of course means more damage and movement speed simply helps you to do faster runs which also means more efficiency in farming and at the end i would then do the runes for survivability which is hp armor resistances and also life rack which is only good in my opinion in compare in combination with the jewel, which gives you life rec because these runes also affect the jewel. And the jewel is really broken in the game right now. You get a lot of HP regeneration, as you can see here. This jewel and the other three is a selection of many jewels that are good for Dragon Knight, but I want to quickly cover up those four jewels in the guide. If you want a complete jewel guide, let me know. But these are four tools I want to talk about real quick. The Jewel of Rage, which we covered before already, is on the right side, which is so strong for farming because it gives you attack speed and crit. The Jewel of Lasting Health, which I want to talk about right now, which gives you for five seconds 10% of your health points, which means you regenerate over five seconds in total 50%, so the half of your health points, which is really, really strong and can be even boosted a little bit with the health regeneration runes, which is in total 32.5% of the 10% that you have. So in total, you will be at 13.5% of your HP for five seconds if you also play with the runes. So that's a really strong tool for survivability, especially SDK if you stand in mob groups you need to recover HP, which can be done by this tool or other skills, which we will talk about just in a second. On top of that, the Thundering Flower Jewel is actually playable and really good for a Dragon Knight. You do 100% more damage with a 10% chance on a smash it, but it's lightning damage, which is good in a group. So definitely recommended to play and also quite useful, which is free extra damage on smash hits. Then a tool which is really interesting is the tool of poisonous thorns, which you will get in the canalization event. If you play with this tool on gray, you will basically never have rage problems because it will always regenerate health for you if you stand next to mobs. Of course, you will take damage with it, but if you have your crit high enough, you will always have your spike shield or your dragon height skill available so you can regenerate those health points instantly. Definitely worth to test in my opinion, especially if you don't have all the relentlessness tools which reduce rage costs. The next trick I want to show you is about Agathon's Guard, 
and how essences change how much damage Agathon's Scar does. As you can see, the description doesn't change upon switching essences, but if I cast the Agathon Scarred with green essences, it does 4 or 8 million damage. But if I'm switching to red, it does way more damage, as you can see now. The cool thing about that is Agathon Scarred does not use any essences. So, so you waste zero essences, but you still do more damage in fight. I use this trick a lot during farming. Usually I cast my banner, so Agathon Scarred spawns. And after that, I cast the Fury of the Dragon which only costs 10 essences, but stays a lot of a long time and does a lot of damage over time, which is especially good at boss fights. Before moving on with the beginner guide and item build, I want to quickly explain why it's so important if that someone plays lightning in your group. As you can see, if I attack the target solo, I do a peak damage of around 36 million with smash but if i have someone in my group who stacks lightning for me the damage goes up so the, my damage increases from smash skill as soon as somebody in my group stacks lightning for me and so i can hit more than 36 million i or my peak damage now with uh, lightning was 120 million but as you can see i also hit around 100 million which is three times the damage that I was hitting solo. So that's why you should always seek out for a mage, dwarf or ranger who plays lightning in your group so you do more damage as well. But for now, let's continue with chapter two of the warrior guide, the beginner build. And I will also show you the skill tree that you can play as a beginner. I listed you all the items that I would recommend you to play as a beginner right here. I would always recommend you to play one-handed as a beginner because you will get more hp from your offhand and from your main hand which i would recommend you to play um, the weapons that i listed there they give you a lot of attack speed and as a beginner if you're fresh level 100 you will need attack speed especially to also reach the 100 percent damage buff which i explained earlier the only exception i would give for not playing one-handed weapon as beginner is if you dropped the anniversary weapon, but that's the only exception for that. I would also not recommend you to play Arachna's Q2 one-handed weapon as a beginner because you will lose too much attack speed. It's a really good damage one hand that I would recommend if you are advanced, an advanced player and you want to play a one-handed build, but this I will cover an item build for that in the next video, which will cover up advanced builds and skill trees for Dragon Knight, which will be the next video from the Warrior Guide. As I stated before, there's no need for tanks in Drakensang right now. That's why we want to get as much offensive values as possible, so we can kill mobs faster. You can circle up to 50 rubies, which are damage gems, and 30 onyxes, which are crit gems. But as a beginner, since you won't have enough crit on all modes yet, I recommend you to focus on crit and that's why you can play or should play opals as fourth crit item later on you will use these opals to play as sixth damage item to even get more damage if you have enough crit but that's why i recommend you to build opals as soon as possible if you have spare royal gems don't melt them use them for your opals on top of that if we watch the item build you can see i recommend you to play the Destruct Omelet, you could also play the Kingsel Necklace from the Summer Event or Medusa Q9 Amulet. The circles that you can see on these builds always say which gems and also which enchantments you should put on these items. Always put on four of the same enchantments, if possible 100% values that you dropped on level 145. I can quickly show you the table of the maximum possible enchantments. But as you can see, on lower levels, the maximum enchantment is not as high as on the highest level, which is currently 145. That's why I recommend you to farm enchantments on Parallel World Bloodshed. As Cloak, I would encourage you to play a fourth crit item, which is never target Cloak. But if you don't have this cloak yet, you can also play the world drop. 
And as you can see, you should play the world drop on damage because it has damage on it. If you all, if you switch an item in the build, you should try to balance it with another item. Let's say, for example, you don't have the helmet from the Sargon event, which is, is a really good crit item because it has an additional crit enchantment as unique enchantment. You could play the world drop helmet on damage f uh, instead, but then you would have to try to cover up with another item, which could be Medusa's Q9 amulet, or you could play the Ring of Seal from the Premium Day, which is especially good if you don't have Jewel of Rage yet, because with every enemy you kill, you get a little bit more crit, which helps you to compensate that you don't have Jewel of Rage yet. On top of that, which is really easy to get, are the Materi Trader shoes. If you don't have the Pregaric shoes yet, you can get them from the Trader and Tetagonetal. It has two possibilities where the Trader can be, depending on how far you finish the quest. Either it's in the before it stands before the entrance in the suburb of Cardoon, or it stands in the north of Tetagonetal, as you can see. You can then buy these for a little amount of Materi fragments. I tested and rebuilt this build for you, as you can see right now, with low gems, so with only the gems that I had in my inventory anyways, and without runes, like it's only grey and green runes that I also had in my inventory, and without jewels at all. And I tried this build and tested how many blood chests I can get, and I tested farming in parallel worlds, and I will show you in just one second. That's the build so far, and as proof, no runes, no jewels. Oh, I only put in the legendary Materi and Wisdom runes, because I wanted to remind you that you should put these up first. <laughs> so let me show you the Wisdom tree. I also only play with low Wisdom tier, because as a beginner you will probably not have much Wisdom, and I want to show you the skill tree now. One point in Rage Attack, use it if you have no more Rage. One point in the Rage Jump, because it gives you a little bit of attack speed. Then 10 points in Smash and the Rising Vigor 3, because that's the main damage skill you have. 10 points in Battle Cry, because it gives you movement speed and a lot of damage. And on top of that reduces the Rage amount you need for Smash. And also Dragon Hide, because it's good for survivability, because you have low resistances in the beginning. And you need to regenerate health really quick. 5 points in Iron Brow gives you 65% armor reduction and one point in Groundbreaker, which covers up the last 37%, so you can break over 100%. One point in Spike Shield, so you taunt enemies that are nearby, and Healing Shield, so you are even more sustainable. And five points in Quick Striker, which we covered in the beginning of this guide. Next, I want to show you some gameplay with this build. But as a little tip, I would recommend you to play with a crit pet and two crit buffs. The crit buffs are unlocked at Jalshoven. You can also buy them from for some amount of gold at a trader. And this will increase your crit even further. And I would recommend to unlock the crit achievement as soon as possible, so you can craft higher tier crit buffs. But now let me show you some gameplay. I tried Blood Chest first in Stonekeep. And as you can see, I have low death, that's why I'm already dying before even arriving the boss. What you should definitely do is to break the shield of the sludge before applying your armor break on it. But as you can see, I can easily kill one sludge with purple essences, and I would recommend you to do that in a group. Just go with the group and try to kill one blood sludge, or if you have stronger players, let them kill more sludges than you do. I then failed trying to kill the second sludge in Stonekeep. But then I tried the Stillwater Bay on blood chest, and I actually managed to kill all five sludges without dying and get two chests from it. Always keep in mind to activate Furious Battlecry for more damage and run speed. To activate Dragon Height for more sustainability, to regenerate health when attacking, to also activate Spike Shield so you get health passively when being attacked, and to break the 
shield of the sludge first and then to apply your iron brow and your groundbreaker to have a full armor break on the sludge. But now enjoy the gameplay with some cool music. But now let me show you how hard it is to kill Kali on Parallel World Merciless. I died there multiple times, but I still could do some damage. But for Parallel Worlds, I would recommend you to go for a group or have someone who stacks lightning for you so you can farm Q1 and Q5 without problems. But then by increasing my crit and nothing else, I only changed the crit. I tried if I could manage to get more blood chests into and actually, I managed to get four blood chests in Stone Cube. Enjoy! That's it for the beginner guide. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you learned something new from all the basics. If not, let me know what I missed or what you see differently. Other than that, there will follow two more guides about Dragon Knight. One is the advanced build and one will be the PvP build. So let me know what you want to see first from these two guides. And I would say let's see you in the next video.